Well, the 29th of March will go down in history as the day that the Royal Albert Hall was opened in 1871. The 100-to-1 shot Kahu won the Grand National in 1947. And in 2007, Rihanna released hit single Umbrella. But more significant than all of those things put together, of course, is that in 1996, in Paris, a new era of rugby league began. Super League blasts off beneath the shadow of the Eiffel Tower in one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Paris Saint-Germain kick off a new era in rugby league against the Eagles of Sheffield. And here tonight at the Charlotte Stadium, we've had a karaoke. We've had the dancing girls. And right now we have a local band, Tori Kunda. There's a great buzz in the stadium. It's a wonderful stadium. And I'm convinced that we'll get a game to match that. Like I say, it's a momentous time for rugby league and going forward into the future. From pasties to pasties. The fullbacks tonight are Lauren Lacuse, Wasale Savatabua, the right wingers are Mikhail Puskanov and Joe Dakotonga. The left wingers Arno Savello and Matthew Crowther. We're just waiting for the whistle of Stuart Cummings. He checks with his officials either side, and the European Super League is underway. I'm delighted to say that joining me on this trip back in time is rugby league historian Tony Collins, and of course the voice of rugby league for so many years, Eddie Hemmings. And Eddie, we heard you there on that VT, a little taste of what it was like on that opening night. Can you quite believe that we're having this conversation and it was 25 years ago. Lewis, I can't, in all honesty. Uh, 25 years, it has gone over in a flash. And of course, I'm now, non, no, now no longer involved in Sky Sports coverage. I retired in uh, April 2019. Uh, but looking back on that night, I mean, did any of us think it was going to happen in the first place? No. Um, did we think it would happen in Paris and we'd get 17,000, nearly 18,000 people there? No. Uh, but the game took off. It was a fantastic match, and Paris Saint Germain won it in the end. I mean, it was just a fairy tale for the game in in France. Paris. I mean, yes, the game had been played there uh, previously. I'm sure that Tony can give you more detail on that than me. But never before had a club game been played there involving a British and a, and a French team. And we got all those people there on the night. We had a West End stage show, and then the game kicked off. And it was just, just unbelievable. It was a fantastic night. We built up to it all the way through the previous winter season. We've been thinking, this is it, this is it. And of course, March the 29th, it was high spring in the, in the French capital. It was just a wonderful, wonderful occasion. And it really was a privilege to be there. And Tony, we obviously were having this conversation. That night will go down as the, the birth of Super League. But the, the story is obviously somewhat wider than that. When I was preparing for this, I was almost struggling to find the, the natural starting point of, of where to pick this up. If you could just give us some context, let's go back a couple of years. How did Super League come about? Why did Super League come about? Everyone talks about the Super League war in Australia. Is that perhaps the natural starting point here? Well, in a sense, the Super League war in Australia that began in, in 1994 and then broke out with a vengeance in 1995 was the, was the catalyst. But in fact, the coming to Super League for British Rugby League was part of a longer process that had been going on really since the 1980s. You can go back to 1986 when Jack Robinson, who was then a d director of Wigan, said what we need is the Super League. Uh, and as far as I can tell, that's the first time it was ever used. Uh, and so there was a campaign to modernise the game, get better TV coverage and also switch to summer. I mean, there was a big campaign that began in the 1990s. Uh, Gary Hetherington being one of the key people in it, uh, to switch the game to summer. And in fact, that had gone back even further. Lance Todd, when he was a manager of Salford, had also proposed uh, switching to summer in the 1930s. So it had, it had a long history and uh, many of the changes that took place were already being spoken about before anything happened in Australia and the Super League war there broke out that provided, you know, that, that lit the blue touch paper that led to what we've just seen on that fantastic night 25 years ago. Uh, that, of all the changes that Super League brought with it, perhaps the shift to summer, Tony, the most significant, 
if you can just kind of cast your mind back as to what the reception, so that was like from within the game, what did people think about playing rugby league in the summer? Well, uh, uh, from my own point of view, I thought, mm, I'm not quite sure about this. And then it must have been maybe the second Super League season. I was stood on the terraces at Headingley watching Leeds and the whole KR on a warm Saturday evening. And I thought, this is the perfect time to watch rugby league. And I suspect a lot of people who were dubious about it in the first place realised after the first year or the first couple of years that there's no better time in Britain to play rugby league when the pitches are hard, the nights are warm, and it just brings out all the natural skills and strengths that the game has. Um, and as I said, th there had been a campaign for this that had been going on since the early 1990s. So it, it was actually quite well thought out and preparations had been made. And you know, people were thinking about how teams should be coached, how players should train and things like that. Uh, but I think once it started to dig in and we saw that, you know, that this was how things were going to be, I think people then thought, you know, this is just absolutely perfect to watch rugby league. And Eddie, with your TV hat on, from an entertainment perspective, a spectacle perspective, was the move to summer the, the perfect thing for the game? Uh, well, yes, it, it probably was. I mean, uh, Tony just talked about the people in rugby league who thought, well, is this really the right thing? is it ever going to happen um i remember vividly we did a boots and all feature steve and i one day at watersheddings in oldham and we were doing a link for the program on the pitch and the sleet and the snow was coming down horizontally straight into our faces and steve looked down the lens of the camera as we did that link and he said because morris lindsay of course was in charge of the game at that stage and he just said come on morris get this game into the summer and that really was the first time that, that I had heard that there was a possibility that we would be playing in the summer. O on a personal point of view, um, and the people at Sky always laugh their socks off at this, I had just purchased, or actually I just put a deposit down on a one-bedroom apartment on a golf course in Spain. And my idea was that every summer that I was working on rugby league, from the end of May to the beginning of, uh, of September, I would be sunning it on the Costa Blanca uh, at a golf course called Villa Martin. And I'd actually signed the cheque for the deal the week before <laughs> Super League was announced. So I did. The, I said to Neville Smith, I said, it was the producer, I said, Nev, I'm in a bit of a quandary here because we were at, at Wigan for the big announcement. He said, what, what, what's the problem? I said, I've just bought a flat in Spain. Well, he fell on the floor laughing and he's never stopped laughing for 25 years. I mean, Everything that I do, timing is disastrous. And that was one of the things. But we got a couple of years out of it. It was fine. But I really thought, I, I thought, Tony, I don't know whether you would agree with this. I was amazed that the clubs, I mean, obviously money was involved. £87 million can turn a lot of heads. I was amazed that the clubs were prepared to give up their big bank holiday programme at Christmas. I mean, Boxing Day, Wigan Saints, Saints Wigan, it was a full house each and every year. And I'm sure it was the same in other parts of, of, of Rugby League as well. And I, I couldn't believe that they were going to turn this in for um, a summer sport where you'd get Good Friday and you get the Easter programme and nothing else. But they did it and they grasped the nettle and off we went. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that surprised me. So because obviously the other thing is a fan. You know, Boxing Day games are one of the most attractive games that, that were going during the summer, sorry, during the winter months. And, you know, and, but on the other hand, obviously, the clubs got a lot of money uh, from Sky to make that switch. So it always, you know, money obviously always makes things easier. But I think also, like you said, with um, uh, the story about you and Steve, um, people were just getting, there were some bad winters in the 90s. And I think people just got, got sick of it. I remember going to a match and then coming home and having to get a bath, sit in the bath to warm up because <laughs> it had been so cold. I think it was doing it at Bellevue. Uh, and so I, I think there was a kind of people thought, you know, let's do something different. Let's give it a go and see what happens. And it worked out. It Perhaps did work the, out. The other I'll, big I'll shift. never forget we went, we, I've just, just, just let me tell you one other story, Lewis. We went to Oldham, but I mean, everything seems to centre around Oldham in my memories of this. We went to Oldham to the water sheddings for our first visit for a Super League match. And of course the water sheddings had no television facilities whatsoever. So Sky had to build uh, a huge gantry on the uh, terrace side of the ground there. And 
this thing, I mean, it was it was absolutely massive. It really was. There was a studio, obviously. There was the camera positions and there was the commentary position. So it was it was a pretty big affair. And just as the match started, I looked down and there was a couple stood underneath the gantry trying to see through this absolute jigsaw of pieces of steel that were forming the, the television gantry. And one of the engineers went to speak to them and said, is everything all right? Are, are you OK here? And the guy turned to him and he said, hey, he said, we've stood here for 30 years. If you think the Super League and Sky are shifting us from our spot, you've had it. We're not moving. So they watched the whole of that game from underneath the gantry. I mean, they were in the early days. Obviously, people have now come to accept that summer is here and is here to stay and has is, is revolutionised the game. But that was what it was like in the early days. It is it's difficult to, to think of the game now, isn't it? 25 years on, not being played in the summer in this country. I guess the, the other big shift that came with it... and. It's funny when you talk about professionalism because obviously Tony Rugby League was was born out of the move to professionalism, but Super League brought with it almost professionalism version two, didn't it, for the game? It was a real big step up for so many of the players involved. Yeah, that's true. I mean, because in 1895, the clubs broke away from rugby union because they wanted to pay players, but very few players were ever full-time professionals until you get to the 1980s when uh, Morris Lindsay took Wigan into full-time professionalism and they became the first team that were all full-time professionals. But Super League allowed the, the the top level of the game to compete on an equal footing with Wigan. And I don't think it's it's an accident that Wigan's dominance that had started in the late 80s and gone all the way through the 90s ended with Super League because other teams could compete on a level platform for the first time. And I think the other thing, if you look at it in broader terms, the 1990s were a big period of change for other sports. The Premier League came in in football. Rugby Union went professional in 1995. So by switching to summer and going full-time professional, Super League allowed the game to um, at least keep pace with the Premier League and Rugby Union in a way that it wouldn't have been able to if it had still stayed as a semi-professional winter game. Well, let's find out a little bit more about what that transition was like for those players. We've caught up with some of the Super League stars from 1996. It really was uh, an experience. It was fantastic. It took it to an absolute new level. And, and it just, it, I think you'd probably say that um, initially it started and it was great for, for the guys that had been part-time. It was like for us, we were part-time and then we went full-time and you're like, wow, this is like, a, this is brilliant. This, you know, it's it certainly put, the game, the great game of rugby league on the map. You know, rugby league was was dying really. You know, we weren't getting much revenue from anywhere, and and the and the package from Sky really did save the the, the sport. And then uh, started a rebuilding phase and a restructuring, rebranding, and I thought it was fantastic for you know what it did. And to get families and, and more kids involved, you know, to to watch a game in in summer, you know, better quality on on, on better, you know, better pitches. Um, you know, and a, a full-time environment of, 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 you know, players training as well. So it's only increased the, the quality of the of the game. And the profile of the game and the players went through the roof. So, yeah, we certainly saw, uh, certainly saw a, a, a massive change in, in, in the, I guess, you know, the, the game in general. You know, Rugby League was um, very much... Uh, a part-time drinking culture and you know after the training you'd have a drink after playing on the sunny you'd have a drink whereas uh, after a few more years of being professional there's a lot more education on uh, diet and and you know why we're actually doing these weights and, and, and that kind of thing so it was exciting times to be to be able to you know to do a job of something that has always been a kind of a, of a hobby as a, as a kid going through you know something that you're just passionate about and then to be able to to do it for a living was uh it was great. I think it was a little bit of an unknown, but the guys were embracing it. The guys were, were, were pretty, you know, um, impressed by the fact that the game were moving forward, and it, and and everybody was was absolutely made up about the fact that the you know the teams were able to go into a, what you'd call a, a full time environment. The excitement of the, of the European and certainly playing in France was something that the, certainly the players looked to looked to. Uh, being full time and training through the day was a big part of it as well, you know. So, yeah, I thought that uh, the players understood it, they bought into it, which was the key is that the, 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 the bought into it so that the, 
that could progress it, develop it. It, it transformed the game. It went from a, a, a game of a, very much a, a, a part-time game with ambitions to be, um, you know, the full-time. And there was only probably, a, before Super League sort of t took hold, there was, there was, I would say there was maybe four, three or four clubs that were actually proper full-time. You know, the, but the game has, has changed, has evolved. Uh, and I think a lot of that is down to the, the professional environment. Uh, some good, some bad. You know, some some has gone away from that 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 flair and that that exciting rugby that we always see to, you know, the more scientific stuff. And, and it's a, it's, just, it's, a, it's about winning now. And and sometimes it's it's taken away that flair. It was great to be great to be part of the old regime. You know, the the uh, the drinking and that. But then it was also great to be a modern professional and um, and and just just play play a sport for your job, which was. Uh, you know, I suppose every, every dream, every kid's dream come true, really. Eddie, as we've just heard, a huge culture shift and transition for those players, but also a big change came in the way that the sport was covered on TV and covered in the media. You were obviously a big part of that alongside Steve-O and, and Neville Smith at Sky. Could you just sort of talk us through what those early conversations were like about how you were going to bring the coverage of rugby league into the you know, into the 90s and into the modern world, I guess. Yeah, it, I can indeed. I'll just make one point about the players. It, it, it was one moment in time. It's a great song, isn't it? One moment in time for the players. It suddenly happened 1995, 1996. I know of one player, for instance, who was on £30,000 a year at his club. And when the, the deal was being done, the Super League deal was being done with all the clubs, he was called in by his chairman. And he was instantly doubled his money, £60,000 contract a year, plus he walked out of the room with a £30,000 cheque. They paid up his, his previous contract as well. So for the players, I understand exactly why they embraced it, because it was a wonderful, wonderful time to be a professional rugby league player. There's no question about that. The money was swilling around the game. As far as we were concerned on television, well, we at Sky had been there since 1990. Uh, and we'd done the big league and done the championship. Uh, and it was sort of 1992, 93, we were doing it exclusively. So we, we were able to to do all the big games. We did the premiership finals. We did the, the, the matches that decided the championship. Uh, and it was going pretty well. Um, I mean, Neville Smith was an innovator. There's no question about that. His camera work, his direction, where he placed his cameras, the cameras in the dressing rooms, all that sort of thing. It was It was brand new. It was... It was like a new toy that rugby league supporters had for Christmas. And, and they had already embraced what we were doing. And Sky, uh, the, the bosses at Sky, they were happy with what we were doing. Neville was called into a meeting in London uh, just before the Super League started. And they said, right, we've got Super League starting in a week or two's time, Nev. Uh, what do you intend to do to be different and make it sing? And he just looked across the table at them and said, well, don't you like what we're doing at the moment? He said, he said yes, we do. But... You've got to have something different. So Nev went off. He went off to the Rugby Football League in, in discussion with Greg McCallum, who was the head of referees at the time. The video referee idea was born. And on top of that, the big screen. The big screen in the stadiums, wherever we went, would show the action to the public, They to the paying public. They were going to be part of a television event. Um, and so that's the way it, it took off. Uh, I remember the first night in Paris, though, um, Stuart Cummings was the referee, He's since become a dear friend of mine and all of ours at Sky, when he came into the commentary box at the back end uh, of my career. And um, Stuart was the referee, and we were desperate, absolutely desperate for the first screen to go up and Stuart Cummings to say, you know, I'm not sure, give it to the video referee. And so he did that, and all of us looked around and thought, what the hell happens now? And I think I think my commentary on the night was saying, I said, well, Stuart Cummings now is going to look at the screen. I forgot that the video referee was sat down in the truck with Neville and all the boys, and he was looking at it in, in precise detail. And full enough, all the videotape editors and, uh, and all the graphics people, they didn't have a clue what was going on either. Nev knew what was going to happen, and Nev directed it through. I mean, the first video referee decision 
I can't remember who, who, who thought he'd scored in the corner or Stuart thought he'd sco scored in the corner. It might have been Freddie Bonke. I can't honestly remember. But basically, he'd thrown the ball forward. <laughs> there was no chance he'd got the touchdown whatsoever. But the big moment came. Up went the screen and we went off to the video referee. So there was the video referee. There was the big screen in the stadiums. Uh, and we just took it on. We just took it on with verve and, and vigour. And we thought we were on the start of something new. We were on the cusp of something big, and indeed we were. It was fantastic. What a, what a uh, what a start to the to all of this and, and, and the video referee. And I think crucially, and this is why VAR, I believe, in football doesn't work. The big screen is there. The big screen is in the stadiums. People can see what's going on, and that's why it was a success. I've watched the broadcast back recently, and and even in that. 20 minutes, half an hour before the game kicks off. The thing that struck me is that there's such a sense of, I guess, adventure and optimism about the whole mm. broadcast. The whole thing w was bold, Eddie. It must have been such an exciting thing to be part of. It was. I mean, we, we, we'd hired our own plane. We went from Speak Airport in Liverpool across to, to Paris. Um, uh, and we flew across. I mean, it was a dry plane, obviously. It wasn't so dry on the way back. Uh, but it was a dry plane. We, we we went into the stadium, the Charlotte Stadium. We all mucked in. I mean, that was the one thing about, and the one thing is about the rugby league team at Sky. We all muck in. There is no superstars. We were humping cameras up steps. We were bringing chairs into the studio. We were helping them out uh, and making sure everything was going to be right. And then we broke for lunch. And we went and had a, a lunch on the banks of the River Seine. I mean, good God, we were, we were, we were in absolute, you know, wonderland that here we were in the middle of the capital city of france we went there for a rugby league match between paris saint germain and sheffield eagles none of us knew what was going to happen we never dreamt for one minute there'd be seventeen thousand eight hundred there but it was just a roller coaster of emotion it was fantastic from start to finish i'm saying that we all went for lunch on the banks of the seine that was the people in front of the camera the poor lads who were rigging the cameras and getting things ready for the kickoff they they didn't come on that <laughs> that was a little bit of a, a case of us and them but we went out the makeup lady came out and we had a we had a great day out and then we got the match and we really really honestly believed that we were on the cusp of something morris Lindsay had said next it'll be barcelona next it'll be milan Coming back on that plane that night after having 17,800 people, we thought next stop, God knows where. You know, we will be, we'll be in another of the major capitals of Europe before much longer. It was, it was just magical. It really was. I, I, I think it was when you speak about it. as well, because I can still remember, I, I can still remember that night sitting in my front room and it, it, I can feel the shivers going up and down my spine because, you know, this was, this was rugby league as it should be in a major European city, um, in a match that had all the atmosphere and tension that you'd expect from from a Champions League get, game in soccer. And I think that's what you know. It was it was a kind of it kind of brought together what rugby league could be. It's that 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 promise of what rugby league could be and what it should be. It, you got it all on that night in uh, in in Paris. And I think you know uh, the, the 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 guys at Sky did a fantastic job, made it memorable. And the players did as well. Everything came together. And I think it was one of those moments that, you know, all the potential of rugby league is there for everyone to see. So it still brings back great memories, even for someone who was, wasn't in Paris, who was just sat in my, uh, in my front room in Leeds. <laughs> Another Tommy, one of the big you... innovations they, they had. I'm sorry, Lewis. I'm, I'll just tell you this. Oh, go for it, Eddie. You... <laughs> <laughs> the, the other big idea that Neville had was that Steve-O, would be, and you saw him actually in the in the, the clip just earlier on. He would be in the in the players' tunnel announcing the team as they came on to the field. So we'd done all the rehearsals all afternoon. When we got back from lunch, it was all all going to be. But of course, the players weren't involved in the rehearsals, and nobody knew. Steve-O was the last one to find out that there was going to be fire, fireworks going off either side of him during the course of him shouting out the teams, and nobody had told the, the dressing rooms that they had to get out in line and come out as steve-o shouted the names and so uh, steve had been rehearsing all afternoon the name of the the uh, paris fullback laurent luchesse right you heard what he came out with <laughs> came out with i thought at the time it was laurent len casey actually but it was laurent lucchese or whatever else he said and of course there was nobody there all the, and the fireworks had gone off and he, he was almost shell-shocked what was going on 
there was nobody coming out past him but he plowed on and the guy next to him was watching he was the the french uh commentator or the the, the ground announcer and our team sheets were always in surnames first and christian names second so as steve was doing his bit in french the other guy was doing uh, for instance when he got down to the, the prop forwards it is broadbent paul <laughs> and it was just it was just chaos it really was we did it the following night in oldham it was the last night we did it it was it only lasted two games and steve was in oldham and wigan were playing a trick on him because it was wigan oldham that night and wigan played a trick on him he shouted martin of name four times gary Connolly came out uh i don't know i, I don't know who else came out but there were four four players and in the end out came Martin of Fire and Steve O's furious, absolutely furious. And he's walking around the back of the ground afterwards. And he comes up to the, to the commentary box. I said, That went well. <laughs> that really didn't go well. And he said, I've just met an Oldham fan. And he said, Hey, Steve O, he said, We've got no chance tonight. I said, he said, I said, Why is that? He said, The five Martin of Fire is playing. <laughs> so that was it. The microphone went down. And that was canned. That idea was canned. But the screen and the video referee carried on. When you look back on it now, Tony, across the 125-year history of this sport, can you can you kind of think of a time, I guess, where there was a bigger change or a more significant shift? Because certainly, I mean, in in recent history, as recent as 25 years, is it feels like the most significant one. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, obviously, the big shift was in 1895 itself when we broke away from rugby union and started the Northern Union. And I guess the only other year that you could compare would be 1906 when teams were reduced from 15 to 13 a side and the play of the ball was introduced instead of a scrum. But um, in terms of the impact that the Super League had on transforming the game, the way the game was uh, viewed, the way it was seen, uh, and it, it, its prospects. Then, no, it had been. It, it was the biggest change in the game for, since since that change to thirteen aside. And I think the other thing that's important. This goes really goes to what Eddie was saying about the important role that that the Sky Rugby League team played in it. Because you, you've got to remember, rugby league has always had a bit of a um, not a not a very good relationship with many in the media. Uh, whether it's the press or on TV. And I think what Sky's coverage gave to Rugby League was self-respect. These are Rugby League people who treated the game not as a second-class citizen or as something that was not quite as good as other codes of rugby or whatever, but Rugby League was treated by Sky Sports, and still is, uh, for what it is. Uh, it, it was people who cared about the game and who gave the game a sense of pride and respect in the way it was covered, in the way it was covered, uh, the innovation that Sky brought in, whether you agree with them or not, because I know these things are always controversial and you put yourself out whenever you change anything. But nevertheless, they're always done from the best interests of the game of rugby league. And I think that was an important step forward and break from the past as well, because we no longer had to, you know, sometimes accept second best or things that we wouldn't put up with. Sky would always put rugby league first and foremost. Mm, we did. They're not paying me to say that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it checks in the post Tony don't worry about that <laughs> but you're right we did we, 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 I always thought that we were on something of a crusade we were here to make this game the best 80 minutes that you could watch during the course of the weekend whenever it was played whether it was Friday, Thursday, Saturday Monday, Sunday, whenever it was the best thing that you could watch we, we rarely talked a game down in fact we never talked a game down we got a lot of stick for that we were called hype and tripe by a number of people because we would never see anything bad in the game. Our big boss at Sky, the late, great Vic Wakeling, you know, he always used to say, you're in competition with Coronation Street. You're in competition with EastEnders. You know, weekends these days, you're in competition with Ant and Deck Saturday Night. You don't tell people it's rubbish. If you tell people it's rubbish what they're watching, bang, they switch off and they might never come back again. So we were on a crusade. We were thinking this is the biggest thing that's ever happened to rugby league in its entire history since the big split in 1895. We've got to make it work. We've got to make it work. And that's the way we treated it. Well, make it work. You did, Eddie. And of course, it all kicked off as we've been speaking about that night in Paris. Let's just take a look back at, at that game in a little bit more focus. 
Super League is up and running, or it will be, in around about 20 minutes when the kickoff comes. But it was exciting, you know, the, the, certainly the France, um, Paris alone, I suppose, and, and the great city it is, or, to, to play in the first game there was, uh, was amazing. It was amazing. The two captains, Pierre Chamarin and Paul Broadbent, the match referee, Stuart Cummins, and this is the moment. I guess it was almost one of those things where it's it's the um, the launch of the new era and and to us um, it was quite a big thing, but we didn't realise that it was going to be such a, a big thing um, as as the game progressed. They look a different side, don't they? They're buzzing now with Mark Aston taking control. Special memories, special moments for for everybody involved to to launch a new era of Super League. I think it was quite a, um, it was quite a, a new thing for us um, with regards to Sheffield. Sheffield were, um, we'd got um, a lot of quite young players. Um, a lot of the players had come through um, developing systems and things like that. So there were a, a lot of our players had, had a lot of big game experience and it was quite a, um, I suppose when you look back now, maybe we didn't realise how much of a, an iconic sort of event it was going to be. When people speak about the results. Well, I think it was probably best for the game that, that, that Paris won the game, but uh, yeah, it was a, a cracking game, a, crack, a cracking, um, excite, very exciting. And, uh, you know, the buzz around Paris at that time were, uh, were electric. Um, I think Paris were a little bit of an unknown quantity and, uh, and it was almost their fairy tale, their first game out and, and they, they turned up and, and fetched it to us and we didn't really hit a straps that night. Pull back tonight, uh, Lauren. Lacuse, Wasale Savatabua. I'm not sure Steve will been on the field were great, but <laughs> but no, no, it was good. It was good, and and introducing the players and, and getting the sight and running out of the tunnel uh, again just took just it was something new, wasn't it? You know, when you look back now, the start of Super League and how much Super League's progressed and how big it is now, um, the, you know that that was towards the the media interest and everything else that went around it were quite a novel quite a new thing to us to keep evolving and, and keep taking steps in the right direction you've got to change certain things and i thought when they did that right time right place and i think we got the right outcome as well yeah, mark aston and paul broadbent there who were involved that night in paris eddie when you said those words at kickoff the european super league is underway did you quite have the sense of what was beginning, what was starting? Did you know what was to come? Well, as I say, Morris had promised us Barcelona, Rome and Milan and, you know, the great capitals of Europe uh, some way down the line. Um, there'd been all the shimozzle in Australia about Super League and everything else and, you know, Super League starting in, in this country. Um, I, th I, think, I think we knew we were on the start of something big. I mean, those words, you know, and here we go, the kickoff for the European Super League. Okay, there was only there was only Paris, but there was London as well. London and Paris were the two sort of givens before we, we went any further, apparently, in the negotiations. They wanted the, the capital cities of, of uh, England and, and France involved. Uh, Jacques Ferreau, of course, the legendary French rugby union player, was involved in Paris Saint-Germain at the time. Uh, the late, great Jacques Ferreau met him a few times and uh, he, he gave it a lot of credence. He gave it, um, as far as the French were concerned, you know, a lot of uh, uh, this is here to stay and the game is worth having a look at. And maybe that's why they got 17,800 on the night that, that Jacques, the little general, was there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I sincerely, as I say, we were on a crusade. I sincerely believed that uh, the European Super League was was here to stay that night. 25 years? Dearly me. We've changed, haven't we? Mark Aston, Paul Broadbent and me, we've all changed a bit. And Steve-O. Good Lord above. The thing that doesn't seem to get spoken about that night too much is that actually it was a really crappy game of football, wasn't it? It was really cut and thrust. And from a product perspective, you probably couldn't have got a better opening night. It was fairy tale stuff. It really was. I mean, Sheffield gave a really good account of themselves, but in the end, Paris Saint-Germain came out and won. Um, and I'll never forget, um, we, after the match, we went down below stairs and, and Gary Hetherington, who of course was the, the Sheffield owner and coach, he did just about everything in those days, didn't he, Gary? Uh, and he was 
obviously crestfallen the below ground that Sheffield had, had got off with a defeat. But he said, uh, and, and this is the sort of guy he is. He, he, he just doesn't look at it from his own club's point of view. He looks at it from the game's point of view, the overall goodness of the game. And, he, you know, he said, well, cracking night, absolutely fantastic. He said, and we gave you the right result as well, didn't we? You know, it was the right result for the Super League uh, moving forward. The Paris had won. Uh, I mean, sadly, you know, Paris didn't last that long after that. that uh, and I think that they had a decent start, but then they went 11 games, I think, Tony, didn't they, without a victory. They sent John Keir over to try and sort things out. And they stayed in the Super League the following year by dint of the fact that Workington had done even worse in the first year. Workington were in. There's a... You know, another name that is no more in Super League. Workington were in, but they finished bottom of the table. I think two wins and a draw. They were they were gone. They were relegated. Uh, and Salford came in the following year. Uh, but Paris Saint-Germain held on. And, of course, 10 years after the start of Super League, we got the Catalan Dragons. And, and what a fairy story that's been. Tony, talk about making a statement. They couldn't have done much more of that in Paris. It really put Super League, the arrival of Super League, on the map, didn't it? Absolutely. I think, you know, you have two big city teams playing in the European capital. And, you know, as Eddie said, it was it was a fantastic game as well. It was exciting and it was the right result. And I think that it kind of, it set the stall out for Super League. But on the other hand, you know, it's always very hard to, to build a club of any sport. Uh, it's always hard to expand the league. And I think perhaps, you know, then that night gave a slightly misleading impression. And of course, one of the problems that the Paris Club had was that it was, you know, it's hundreds of miles from rugby league's heartlands in the south of um, France. And you wonder maybe in the long term, if maybe it hadn't been Paris, but maybe Marseille, which is near, you know, on, on the coast in southern France, much nearer the rugby league heartland, maybe the, the club would have been more sustainable. And then, you know, that dream of having the game played regularly in Barcelona, Milan, Munich, wherever, then that would have been a little bit closer. But as an example of what, rugby league can be and should be it was a fantastic night that you know even today i can still remember the the chills that were going up and down my spine watching it and that razzmatazz of course that we saw in paris wasn't confined to paris eddie alluded to it in oldham a little bit earlier on the new era of super league brought with it a kind of brand new match day experience of course and we caught up with some of the players involved in that time and just what that brought with it and how that was for them the match day experience. I remember Oldham were in the Super League in the first year. And we got to Oldham and they had these two live bands on as we were warming up. And I think it was the Beatles, the bootleg Beatles it was. And I love the Beatles. And then I just remember in the warm up getting into these Beatles songs thinking, right, I've got to concentrate. And I think um, I think that was it. That was an exciting part of, of the transition to, to Super League and Summer Rugby, certainly for the fans. It was about, you know, making it a whole occasion. You know, you see it. In, uh, in in other sports, certainly they like the American sports, you know, the NFL and, and stuff like that. So, you know, going to a game is no longer just about the eighty minutes, you know, when the when the game's on. It's it's about the whole the whole day. It certainly was something that um, we embraced, we we, we enjoyed, uh, but it was certainly going on to another level, it, and it was needed. There was no doubt about it. You know, to to keep evolving and, and keep taking steps in the right direction, you've got to change certain things. And I thought when they did that, right time, right place. And I think we've got the right outcome as well. There was some who did it better than better than others, you know. God rest his soul, Peter Deakin at, at Bradford. You know, what a, what a show they always put on at Odsall and, you know, packed crowds. And, you know, it was, uh, it was always great as a player to play, you know, with fans, you know, having that environment and that, that exciting atmosphere. It was all, all razzmatazz, all glamorous, and it was... It really was an experience. It was fantastic. There was a development um, sort of process going on in every single corner, I think, of the game. And um, and overall, I mean, it's, it's been, I think it's been enormous for our game. And I think that the, the development and way it's all gone, it's put, it put us put us alongside all the, the other, really what you call high-level profile sports. Tony, some of those things, I mean, Moz mentioned there the bootleg Beatles. At the time, that must have felt about as un-rugby league as you could have got. <laughs> yeah, well, I, again, I remember uh, because my two daughters were very little. And I was always a bit juiced about the mascots. And, uh, yeah, I think, do we really need this? It's about the game, of course. But, but then when I told us to the match, they loved the mascots. 
and the mascots in every every ground he went to, mascots were surrounded by people, uh, by young people, by kids. Um, people loved the the dancing and the halftime, and it really did change the game. And I think it meant that there was a little bit more um, for people to watch, and then it added to you know what's since become known as you know match day entertainment. It's it's an exp the whole day is an experience, or the whole evening is an experience. It's not just you go there, it's kick off, half time, and then you go through till full time. That's all the enjoyment there is. There's lots of other things going on. And I think when you saw, uh, you know, particularly the kids, the next generation of the game, they're enjoying themselves. You understood how important this was. And I think I would just say, though, it's this is, and I think this goes back to the point about how some of these things were already in development before Super League. Keithley Cougars pioneered this in, uh, in 93 and 94. So that, I think they're often forgotten about in the way that they started that revolution that that super league carried on and um yeah so again from from little acorns uh, uh the big oak trees grow and i think that's uh, a lot of the credit for all those fantastic innovations they were first tried out by keithley so so hats off to them as well but yeah it, it transformed the game and it made the game more family oriented more more of a uh, of an all-round entertainment experience which is you know what people in what people today and then wanted. Uh, Eddie, were these the things that made those early days of Super League so special? Were these the things that made it feel different and a real experience to be part of? It very much so. I, um, you, you, you know, you're right. Um, I said before that in Paris, the first night a West End show began and then all hell broke loose on the field as the, as the players took centre stage. I never was a real fan of going to Odsall in the winter, I must confess. You know, it's a massive, vast open bowl. It was freezing cold. The fog at one stage, I remember seeing coming in down the, the terracing and we lost a game midway through the first half. I think it was against Wigan back in the old winter days. Going to Odsall, and Adrian Morley mentioned uh, Steve, uh, Peter Deakin, uh, going to Odsall was a fantastic experience. I mean, it wasn't just the game that kicked off whenever it kicked off, afternoon or evening. It was everything that went on around the stadium. And they had they had the bowl. They had the ability, the space to do all this. Uh, and they had bands on the field. They had face paintings. They had, they had a fun of the fur going on. You know, the kids were all involved pre-match. And then they all sort of settled down 10, 15 minutes before kickoff. The gates opened up and the ball came in. The ball came in in a, in a motorcade and sometimes there were vintage cars, sometimes there were fire engines, you know, blowing the hooters, blowing the horns, blue lights flashing. And the ball came in and was introduced to the crowd. It was just fantastic. God love them. Bradford Bulls and Peter Deakin, they set the standard. They really showed the rest of Super League how it should be done. As I said, they had a few things going for them and they had such space around their stadium. But it was it was just wonderful. And Tony's right, Cougar Mania. Cougar Mania, and, the, and they still, I think, believe they should have been involved, the Keith Lee Cougars, in 1996. You know, I think I, think I, I, I might be right in saying, Tony, that they, you know, they, they almost won a place in Super League out there on the field where it really mattered. Uh, but it was taken away from them. Uh, tragically, as far as they're concerned, I'm sure. But Cougar Mania, that was the blueprint. And you've got to give Peter Deakin or whoever it was at Bradford, they look, saw what was going on there. They picked it up and, by Jove, didn't they run with it in the first couple of years? I mean, 20,000 at, at Odsall to see, you know, a Leeds game, for instance. We were lucky if we got four and a half in the, in the winter. For, and you'd sit there and shiver and shake. It was dreadful. But once the summer came along, once the sun came out, once the ball was introduced, once the fairground opened, once the face painting started, it was just a fantastic day out. It really was. Just brilliant. And 25 years, obviously, when we look back at it now, it inevitably has come with its ups and downs. Tony, are there any bits that you look at and you think, or they could have done that a bit differently, or perhaps we shouldn't have gone down that road, or you know that was a mistake, or we should have done more of that. Well, I, I, you, know, you know, rugby league, rugby league people are always uh, are always arguing amongst themselves. Every, uh, every got, everybody's got an opinion, wants to express it. But 
I think there are some things, obviously, that didn't quite go as we expected. I mean, obviously, we're not in Barcelona, well, not very regularly, anyway, and we're certainly not in Rome or, or, or Milan. Um, and I think, you know, only four teams have ever been Super League champions. That's not a good thing. We've tinkered around too much. You know, we've never stuck to a to one plan for any real length of time. But having said that, um, it has changed the game, and I think it's changed the game for the better. Just in terms, crowds have gone up. Um, you know, at, at points in Super League history, certainly for 2008, um, before the financial crash, uh, crowds in crowds in rugby were bigger than what they had been since the 1950s, and they're still bigger than what they what they have been today. What well, today? Well, when we get back, anyway, all things being equal, will be they're still bigger than what crowds were throughout the 70s and most of the 80s. So in in those terms, it's been a success. It's it's added to the branding of the game, to the identity of the game, and it's also allowed the game to the game's players to develop as athletes because they've been full-time professionals. They can play and train and train in the very best conditions, and so that's been very important. And I think when you look at all the other changes that have gone on in the sporting world, in terms of football, uh, rugby union, cricket, then we had to move to summer. We had to do this. Super League had to come in order to take the game to the next level and keep pace with all the developments that are taking place in society. Because the other thing is, 25 years ago, there was no internet, no mobile phones. Most of the technology that we're using today at this very moment didn't exist. So it was almost in a different world. And Super League helped prepare the, the, the game for that changing world. And hopefully it will be able to take it on to uh, another step higher in the future. Eddie, as someone who obviously was involved at the very beginning of all of this, when you look at it now, in terms of increasing the profile of the sport, in terms of revol revolutionising the way we look at the game, and in terms of making Super League as big as it can be, Rugby League as big as it can be, I should say, do you think Super League has achieved what it set out to do 25 years ago? I think broadly it has. I mean, you look back and... We have tinkered about with the, the playoff system, I think, far too often. Five, six, eight teams, super eights, you know. The one thing that we have achieved is the grand final. The grand final that happened in 1998. Uh, again, we were, we were heavily involved in, in discussions about this. They've had the grand final in Australia. Um, and you have to be your optimum best on the last game of the season. And I remember the discussions were centred around, should we be having a playoff system rather than a premiership final at Old Trafford? Why don't we take the grand final to Old Trafford and see how that develops? And we'll do a playoff system just as they have in Australia. We, we started off with the top five. They call them semi-finals in Australia. And I could never get my head around why we had five semi-finalists. But that was just the fact that I was a bit thick. Um, it was a fantastic thing that started in 1998 the grand final. And I remember uh, Maurice Lindsay uh, and the officials saying uh, to Neville Smith and Sky, you, you, you're going to kill the game. Saturday night, under lights at Old Trafford, it'll never work. It will never, ever work. The first match, the rain pelted down from midday. And I think we got 30, 36,000 people there. And from that moment on, the grand final was born. And I don't know, I might be biased, but I think that the grand final now has overshadowed the Challenge Cup final in many ways. I think that the, the break from Wembley, the original Wembley, the Wembley weekend, I don't think that helped the Challenge Cup. But the grand final now is the biggest night of the year in Super League. And it is absolutely sensational. And last year, with all the trials, the tribulations, the troubles that we had, look at the game that we got between Wigan and St. Helens. And look at the final second of that match. You know, the Jack Wellsby try, it's not as good as it's not as good as wide to West. We all know that. It's not as good a try as that. That will never be completely and utterly eclipsed. But what a moment that was for the Super League last year when he scored with the very last play of the game. Just just fantastic, the grand final. Uh, I don't think the split uh, into Two governing bodies helps. I, I, I don't think rugby league is big enough. It's not a Premier League. It's not a game that can have the Super League and rugby league, rugby football league running things separately. I think it all should come back under the one roof. And with with Robert Elston's uh, 
sad demise. I think that perhaps that will happen in the near future. But, you know, eight countries now, eight countries around the world, Russia, North Africa, uh, Australia, New Zealand, th th that's a given. Uh, the Middle East, the United States, Brazil. Uh, these countries all take Super League matches on television. That's a that's a success story in itself, I would venture to suggest. Uh, just You mentioned Wide to the West there, Eddie. Could you just tell me what you told us <laughs> off air, what you call the part of the house that you're sat in? This is, this is my Wide to West room. You can see why, because there... This is what St. Helens very generously gave me as a, as, a, as a retirement gift. It's got the commentary there and it's got all the players, little pen pictures of them all, involved in that, uh, in that, that magical moment, the 22nd of September 2000. I mean, blimey, that's, what's that now? That's, that's even longer. That's 21 years, 20, 21 years ago. Um, a wonderful, just... One of the great, great nights of my life. I've got that, and on the other wall over there, I've got an oil. Uh, it's not a painting. It's it's just in. I'll get it off the wall and show you. It was given to me. There it is. All it's a, it's it's an oil painting of all the the names, and it's the commentary. And I'm so proud of it. I'm so proud of the Wide to West try. Um, if that's if that's what people remember me by in the years to come, so be it. You know, uh, people have said it's rugby league's equivalent of uh, Kenneth Wilson Holmes. They think it's all over. It is now. And if that's the case, you can't get much better than that, can you? But yeah, this is the Wide to West wing. <laughs> and absolutely, one of the most iconic moments in in rugby league history. Yeah. And your words, of course, have immortalised it. I just there's an interesting point to be made here, I think, Tony. We're having this conversation, obviously, 25 years on from the birth of Super League. We're also having this conversation, obviously, in the midst of a pandemic. Now, all roads at the moment seem to, to lead to May when crowds will come back. And we seem to... There's a lot of conversations going on about clubs struggling. But actually, a lot of the conversations that I've had is that in the long term, this will increase the enthusiasm. People know what they've missed now. People know what they haven't been able to go to for the last year. Do you think if there's a, there's a storm to be weathered here, absolutely, but could this be a real kind of launch pad moment for people to get back in rugby league stadiums, that enthusiasm to come back and you know, a real energy boost for Super League going into the future? Yeah, I, I, I think and I particularly hope that that's the case because I think if you look back at, it's not really comparable, if you look back at the two world wars when the game was suspended, there was a little bit of play, but not very much. The game was suspended. There was no League or Cup competitions in both wars. And at the end of both of those wars, people flocked back in their tens of thousands. There were record crowds for several seasons after both World Wars. And I think that it's, um, that, that quite, could quite well happen again because we, there's nothing quite like standing on the terraces or sitting down at a live rugby league match. And it's, you know, it's the thrill of the entertainment. It's been in a crowd, it's been with people, and that's what everybody's missed over the last 12 months under lockdown. And so, you know, the fact that, you know, we can now go and see an incredibly exciting game uh, with thousands of other people, hopefully, um, I think will be incredibly attractive. And of course, you've got the World Cup in October, so that will be, you know, a major, major sporting event. So I think that all things being equal, and if this really, if we are approaching the beginning of the end of the, the pandemic in its most serious form, then fingers crossed, all the historical signs point to uh, something fantastic happening when crowds are allowed back into the grounds, hopefully sooner rather than later in the forthcoming season. Yeah, brilliant. Gents, I've absolutely loved the last hour spent in your company having this conversation with you both. It's been fantastic to turn the clock back I'm just going to wrap it up. I'm going to ask the same question to both of you. I'm going to put you on the spot. Tony, I'll come to you first. I'd like you to give me one memory, one standout moment from the last 25 years of Super League that you really think epitomises what it's, what it's all been about. No, I'm really on spot now. Um, well, I don't want to be born and say wide to west because that, that's what everybody says. Um, <laughs> I, I've got to say, I thought... I think, I know, I'll say I'm stealing Eddie's thunder, but... Um, 
I've got to say, I thought the Jack Wellsby moment was um, that was such a great game. You know, it could have ended as it was and gone into extra time and, you know, a sudden death drop goes or whatever. Um, but for such a game like that, the fact that it had taken place through all the trials and tribulations that the game and, you know, everybody, the world had gone through uh, last year, the, the two teams provided such a fantastic spectacle. And then it's won on the very last touch of the ball in the game by, you know, a, a youngster who would just play his first full season. It was just magical. And I think it sums up everything that's great about rugby league, the intensity of the game, the skills that were shown by the players, and that ability just to bring out the most dramatic possible moments. So yeah, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be I'm gonna be dull and say the Jack Wells we tried because it was just it was just magical. Eddie. Well, there it is. That's the moment for me. I mean, the white arrest, as I say, it's 21 years ago now. It, 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 I'm sure it will be eclipsed in the, the years to come. Uh, Tony's absolutely right. The Jack Wellsby try was sensational. Um, I hope Bradford Bulls come back and give us some more great nights at Odsall with the ball coming in uh, around the, 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 the pitch there. Um, Listen, I, I, I struggle to remember things that happened 25 minutes ago, never mind 25 years ago. Uh, but uh, for me, uh, it's got to be this. It's got to be the wide to west. Um, I noticed that Sky are taking over one of the channels in the week leading up to the start of this year's Super League campaign. And they're going to be running 24 hours, seven days a week rugby league. And on the promotion of that event, Sky have mentioned we will be looking back at the great moments like the iconic wide to west try from 2000 and the playoffs so for me that sums super league up the wide to west it, it was just my greatest moment i think Dwayne west's greatest moment it was his only it was his only match in the playoffs chris joint's greatest moment why it's not called the chris joint try i don't know probably because of the commentary it's wide to west it's wide to west but uh, that's the one for me that one and and wellsby to be fair Great end to last year's grand final for all the reasons that Tony has just mentioned. Gents, thank you so much for joining us. It's been fantastic to see you both and speak to you both. 25 years of the Betfred Super League. It's absolutely flown by. Here's to the next 25. Yeah.